Reverend Father, dear seminarian, faithful in Christ. Today, the Feast of the Holy Family, there's so much that a priest can preach on, especially in these days when the family is under so much attack in the world, even tragically sometimes in the church. But I want first to call your attention back two or three years now. You probably remember, maybe some of the younger people don't. But back in 2012, when the leaders of Chick-fil-A came out in support of traditional marriage, uh, in support of true marriage, marriage between an unmarried man and an unmarried woman. And there was this great outcry in the far left against Chick-fil-A. And there was this attempt to mobilize the far left against Chick-fil-A. So there were protests staged. Uh, there were all sorts of terrible things that were planned to be done to Chick-fil-A. Boycotts that were called for. And in response to that, so many faithful people across the country, so many people that still hold marriage in high regard and understand its dignity and its place as the foundation of society, gather together on one day to show Chick-fil-A their support, to show their appreciation. I remember I was still a seminarian at the time, and I went down, uh, I was stationed at Maple Hill with Father Borden, and he and another priest and I went to the local mall where Chick-fil-A was, and the line was hours long just to get fast food chicken. It was quite remarkable. The line went all the way around this kind of shopping mall. Just huge, huge support. And not a single protester was there that we could see. And I remember being in that line hour after hour, and at some point this woman came up to us, you know, seeing three men in cassocks, which is something she wasn't super familiar with, being a Protestant, she came up to us and spoke to us and welcomed us to the fight. It's so good to see you here, she said. And she meant it in kindness, so I said nothing, but inside how it galled me that here she was welcoming us to this fight. And a certain part of me wishes I could go back to that day not to be less charitable, but to be more truthful and to tell her that she could not welcome me to a fight because she was fighting with our enemies. She was fighting with our enemies, although she didn't know it. For almost a hundred years now, Protestants in this country and around the world have gradually ceded ground on marriage. They've collapsed before no-fault divorce. Very, very, very rarely we find a Protestant that uh, in principle denies divorce. And they've collapsed against the plague of contraception. So it began with the Anglicans uh, almost a hundred years ago now, around 1930. They officially endorsed contraception. And every Protestant sect that I know has followed them. And so what they've done is they've denied the end of marriage. They said marriage has no finality, no purpose. It's not intrinsically ordered towards the bearing and raising of children. And they've denied one of the principal properties of marriage, that it cannot be dissolved, except under extremely rare circumstances. It cannot be radically dissolved by any power on this earth. They've destroyed what marriage is for. They've destroyed what marriage is. And they've left marriage 
to be this empty husk, this meaningless name. And then they dare say that that name can't be applied to relationships that they find quite rightly to be disordered. But the problem is that they don't have a leg to stand on in the argument because they've reduced marriage. They've impoverished marriage. They've made it something meaningless, but then said, you can't have it. I wish I could go back and talk to that woman. Michael Davies, in a lecture that I listened to several years ago, wondered at the fact that this particular disorder probably afflicts 1-2% to of our population, and yet, by throwing all their energy into this fight, they've managed to shift public opinion. So that now it seems that an approaching majority agrees with them tolerates them, celebrates them, supports their sin, destroys marriage. Michael Davies at the time wondered, you know, in a society like ours, where 20% of the population, not 1 to 2%, but 20%, claim to be Catholic, If we had that same zeal, what we could do? Our Lord, of course, in the Gospels, has the same sorrow when he's talking about the uh, unjust steward. And he says, the sons of this world have zeal for their business, but the sons of light do not. It should prick our conscience, especially in this battle. Now we stand in a situation where 36 states, in 36 states now, this abomination has a legal status of marriage. In 14 only do constitutional amendments uh, remain against this, and six already of those have been overturned by the courts and are subject to appeal almost certainly no lose. So we're on the brink now of 42 states that's being legalized. We've been promised, of course, that it would mean nothing to us, that it would have no effect on our lives. That is not true. Just the other day I was reading about a florist now in Washington who had a long-standing customer, and one day the customer walked in, it's very recent, and said something to the extent of, congratulate me, I'm getting, you know, quote-unquote married to, uh, to my partner. And then Laura said, I can't give you flowers for that. And she was sued. And she lost. And she's joining a long line of those that are losing in such cases. You've probably heard of bakers that have refused to make wedding cakes, photographers that have refused to take photos, bed and breakfast proprietors that have refused to lodge. All of them have been sued. As far as I know, all of them have lost. In the political realm, in the latest presidential election, Rick Santorum, his feet were held to the fire over the issue of just contraception. How long before the media will begin to hold to the fire those politicians that dare speak out against unlawful attempts at marriage? How long until it's impossible to have an electable, quote-unquote, politician that would dare speak out in the public sphere 
against illicit attempts at marriage. What kind of pool of leaders will we have when we have to draw them from those who will not stand up for what's right and what's wrong in the public sphere? Where else will they cave on what's right and what's wrong? There's a storm gathering on the horizon. We hear its distant thunders. We see its darkening clouds gathering. But there is an error with being too fixated on that storm. The devil wants nothing more than to keep our eyes fixed on that storm. And to not watch the holes that appear in our own roofs, the lack of preparation we have in our own lives for the storm to come. The devil's just as happy to have people lose their souls lusting after evil as he is to have them lose their souls in fear of losing the good. One of the reasons our Lord, over and over again, tells us in the Gospels, be not afraid. It's one of those shining moments of heroism in the life of John Paul II. St. John Paul II, who stood on the papal balcony, stood on a wall before the Iron Curtain, and without fear, shouted to that iron curtain, be not afraid, and mobilized the people to overthrow communism. It's so easy for us to peer through the newspapers to the problems of the world in order to be blind to the problems in our own lives. It's so easy to groan over the need of conversion for the world and to never worry about converting ourselves. To see faith grow cold in the world and not worry that the rosary grows cold in our lives and in our families. To not worry that the enthroned sacred heart remains lonely in our homes. It's no wonder today that in the epistle, this day that celebrates the Holy Family, the epistle calls us to imitate the Holy Family, to put on mercy, humility, forgiveness, all of these things, a call to conversion in our families. We know that our Lord elevated marriage to a sacrament turning the family into a school of salvation for us. How often we're absent from that school. Overwhelmed by fear of what's coming. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. And it's not, it's not the fearlessness of the Stoic, kind of the affected apathy of the Stoic, you know the Stoics, they were these ancient philosophers, and they said, whatever might come is coming, and there's no need to worry about it, because you can't change it. And our job is to just be without feeling before the mercilessness of fate. That's not the lack of fear of a Christian. The lack of fear of a Christian springs from confidence in Almighty God. It springs from the knowledge that God has put us here for a specific purpose. He's put us here to fight a specific war. And he doesn't send us into that war unequipped. And he doesn't send us into that war except knowing that it's in this war that we're going to find our salvation. That's where our fearlessness arises. In Romans 8, St. Paul tells us, Who then shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or famine, 
or nakedness or danger or persecution or the sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are put to death all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. But in all these things we overcome. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor might nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. And again he writes in Romans 8 and we know that to them that love God all things work together for good. All things work together for good. Let us set aside fear in a great confidence in Almighty God. A great desire to be generous with Him. To be courageous with Him. To fight for Him. To find our salvation in the very storm that's gathering. And may He bless you as you do so. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.